You know, the reason why I can knock it is because I've had it. You know, people say, oh, don't knock it till you try it. I tried it. I tried it. I can knock it. Right? What do you want? Where do you want to go? Because I can go anywhere. And I don't mind talking about it. You want to go hard drugs? I can go hard drugs. You want to go prostitutes? I got a prostitution story. Gun shootouts? I got shootout stories. You want to go molestation? I got that. You want to go abuse? Physical abuse? I got that. You want to go abandonment? I got that. Where do you want to go? Right? I can go there unashamedly. And the reason why I can go there unashamedly is because I've experienced the healing from a lot of those traumas. And I can tell you, I tried to patch up all of that damage with winning things. There are some conversations that we feel we're not allowed to have. This is a filter each of us is born with, or maybe it's something we learn to have as we grow up. However, there was one young lady from Texas who just never had this filter the rest of us had. And fortunately for us, she raised a little boy named Lecrae. And she never got the memo to raise Lecrae with this filter either. What's going on, y'all? This is Lecrae. Lecrae. If someone's going to say it, it's probably going to be Lecrae. I, I mean... Don't mince your words. I have seen some ratchet streaks, some, some appearances on your online. But what happens when a mind like this asks harder questions? I think if I was to do a show, I wanted to be known for, you know, I'd want to, I'd want to do something where people can feel like, man, I'm becoming who I was made to be, not who everybody wants me to be. Nuance is something you can only find if you're willing to go deeper. And those who are willing are often misunderstood by those who aren't. This is The Deep End with LaCroix. Cray, are you worried about what people will think? Or if they'll accept the idea of you doing a podcast? Oh, yeah. You know, my mantra has always been If you live for acceptance, you die from rejection The reason why that's my mantra Is because most people Passionately preach about their own struggle Right? Whatever you hear somebody constantly talking about Is what they internally battle And so When I'm saying if you live for acceptance You die for rejection is because I know that from personal experience I know that because I've lived for the acceptance of other people And I've suffered from their rejection So yeah, I I want acceptance even though I know it's superficial. I'm already accepted by God. And so I have to remind myself of that on a regular basis as I'm pursuing different things, as I'm saying things that could be controversial, that could be hard to hear, that sometimes you're not going to be accepted. As a matter of fact, I'm a Christian. That's part of a Christian's call is to understand you're not going to be accepted by everybody. But at the same time, if you know this is what you're supposed to be doing, then you got to do it. If I'm being honest, it's like, in some senses, I'm letting go of my identity, which is not a healthy statement because I am not who I am on stage. Like I'm not the fullness of who Lecrae is, is not artist and rapper and performer. But I've been doing it so long that it is really strange to not be seen in that role. But at the same time, my soul is burdened for people to see me as something other than just a rapper. It, it does get frustrating when you have something to contribute to culture, to society, and, and to society, and people say, stick to rapping, as if that's all I am. I am a diamond, as we all are, and a diamond is multifaceted. There's many sides to it. And the, the music side, the performance side, is only one side of who I am. And so it's important for me to let go of that for another side of that diamond to show. I've been doing it 20 years, y'all. 20. I know I don't look that old, but I'm, I've been doing this 20 years. And so because I come from this dysfunctional family, this broken background, it's scary because in my mind, I'm programmed to think if this doesn't win, if this doesn't work, then everything fails. So that part is scary to me because you got to remember, I have this trajectory of winning, you know, I have this trajectory of number one album, Grammys, uh, million subscribers on a platform, platinum hits. And for a lot of people, if your identity is wrapped up in winning, 
in one particular area to start from scratch is scary to say, hey, I need to invest in something else. And what if this takes 20 years to 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 generate the same type of fruitfulness? Yeah, it's scary. You know, when I'm out here on the road and I see the connectivity with fans and I and I and I see the love for people, uh, the love that people have for me. I'm very grateful. Right. And I'm very appreciative of it all. But at the same time, um, I also realize that I have a roster full of artists that have immense impact on people in the same way. And if that's not what discipleship is all about, if it's not about passing the torch, then what is it? A lot of churches die because the pastor just won't get out that pulpit. And let somebody younger and, and, and vibrant and insightful speak to the culture now. And that's what I want to do as well. There's so many other ways for me to contribute. It doesn't have to be this way. And, I, and, and when, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples, he said, hey, when you're younger, you do this. When you're older, you do this. You, some things you got to put away. Well, the life expectancy in his time period was like 40 to 45 years old. So older was like 35. And that means... It's time to stop thinking about your ego, what you can build and how you can build others, how you can invest in other people. There's I am enjoying investing in other people more than I'm enjoying the praise and the applause. I want to see other people invest in the world and I want to be behind those folks pouring my life into them in any other kind of capacity other than just being on stage. So those are kind of some of the moments that have hit me. And then to be honest with you, you know, fanfare is fickle and I really don't care for fanfare like I once did. It's fickle. People think they own you in some respects when they're fans of you. I'd rather be someone that you are influenced by, encouraged by, edified by, challenged by than just someone that you feel like you need to be entertained by. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but I'm more than an entertainer. And when people feel like you're just there to entertain them, then they feel like they can put a quarter in you and you dance and you do what they want you to do. I have more to offer than merely entertaining people. And so I'm not just gonna be a monkey that people can put a quarter in and I do a dance and that's all I'm good for. Um, there's more value in me in my latter years than just that. And I wanna explore that and I wanna use that. You know. Listen, <clears throat> you got to jump. I mean, there's no, the, the, without risk, there's no reward. It doesn't work any other way. You know, we, we live in this instantaneous, like microwavable society right now where you can post it on TikTok and go viral tomorrow. That's really not the way the world works. Like that is uh, an anomaly in the system. If you go outside and you plant some food, it's not going to grow tomorrow. We have bought into the idea that things happen instantly because we can walk into a grocery store and get a piece of fruit that's not even in season right now, right? So we have bought into this myth that everything is just going to come to us without us having to put any investment or risk or put something on the line. You're going to have to risk something if you want to see the reward. The life is not a lottery ticket. You know, you don't just get to scratch it off and then, yay, you know, I'm, I'm doing well. You're going to have to make an investment. And I think a lot of us are afraid of that. You cannot pop a pill and all of a sudden be cut up and muscular and 5% body fat. It, that's not the way the world works. You got to get in the gym. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to diet. You're going to have to do a caloric deficit in order to get to a specific weight. And in the same regard, you're going to have to invest some time, effort, energy, blood, sweat, and tears, money, time to see the fruit of your dreams come to fruition. That's generally speaking, that is how God system is orchestrated in society, right? He does not do this. When that happens instantly, it's called a miracle. There are miracles because they don't happen all the time. So everybody's looking for a miracle. Miracles don't come every day. They don't happen all the time. There are rare occasions. Generally speaking, if you're Joseph, you're going to have to get arrested, be sold into slavery, do some time in prison, live in Potiphar's home, and then you'll be exalted to the second hand at the side of Pharaoh. That's generally how it works. And so that's just the principle here. You know, if you're David, you're going to be in the shepherd. You're going to be in the fields dealing with dirty sheep, you know, chasing down stuff. And then your dad's going to say, 
all of the brothers come up here so we can figure out who's been anointed as king and you're not even going to be called because nobody even had you in mind. You were the last one they thought could take on this responsibility. So now you've got imposter syndrome once you get to the position that, you know, someone has called you up to and you're afraid to do it. Then you take the opportunity, you put the risk online and you got King Saul trying to kill you at every turn. So you're wondering yourself, was it really worth it? But at the end of the day, Yes, because that's what you've been called to do. You've been called to risk it. You've been called to trust God. You've been called to put in the blood, sweat and tears. And that's the only way you're going to see the progress that you want to see. I can look behind myself after 20 years and see the fruit of my labor. Why? Because I put in the time and investment, not because I snapped my fingers and voila, this just happened. That's not the way the world works. The beautiful thing is you don't have to sit there saying, man, where's my help going to come from? Because you've, if you know God, God is by your side. He's walking with you. Psalm 23 says, goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. That word pursue in the original language means to hunt. Literally, goodness and mercy is hunting you every day if you're trusting in God. You're not just out here aimlessly flailing. He's got a plan and you're walking in the midst of it. And so you got to stop saying, God, take this hard path away. Give me an easy path and start saying, God, give me feet for the path because I know you will. That's the way you function. That's the way you operate. I know it's difficult. I know it's scary. I know you're like, but, 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 but I'll be broke or I'm going to struggle or I got these bills or I got these family issues or nobody believes in me. But, but guess what? Those are literally the obstacles that are going to create endurance and persistence and make you into a new person. Everybody's got to go through the cocoon in order to become a butterfly. You got to. That's a part of the process. And that's what's going to mold you into the person that can sustain everything that you're trying to build. If it came to you overnight, you wouldn't know what to do with it. If it came to you through some trial and tribulation, you're going to understand the work it takes to maintain it. And it's going to stay. And you won't have to fear that any moment it's all going to disappear. No, because you know what it took to get there. You know what it takes to keep it there. And you know what it takes to start over if you have to, because you put in the work. You can do this. Right. I don't believe in a fixed mindset. I believe in a growth mindset. A fixed mindset says everybody is has only a certain level that they can achieve. And then it's a wrap. That's not true. Michael Jordan was not great out the gate. Right. Uh, Michael Jackson was not great out the gate. They all put in time, effort and energy and work. They put in their 10,000 hours and that's how they got to where they are. You can put in 10,000 hours and be somebody you don't even recognize. Become something that you didn't even know you could become. Why? Because we're not fixed. We can grow. There's something in our brains called neuroplasticity that allows your brain to actually grow, learn new things, process new things. That's why God says renew your mind daily because your mind can be renewed. You can be a different version of yourself today. Literally start today. I think that you have to invest in yourself. And investing in yourself is not about investing in your ego. It's investing in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind. And in order to do those things, you're, you're, you can't sit stagnant, right? You can't. You, you're going to have to get out of the way of your fears. You're going to have to get out of the way of the obstacles that you feel like are going to keep you back and challenge yourself to be more than what you are right now. It's not osmosis. You're not going to grow by osmosis. Nobody drifts into discipline, right? I remember being at the beach with my daughter when she was 10, her and one of her best friends. We were at the beach. And while we're at the beach, I'm telling her and her friend, don't go too far out because I don't want you to get swept up under by the, the waves. And so they were not going far out but as I looked at them, they kept moving further to the left. And what I noticed was that it's not the giant tidal wave that is the one I should have been looking for. It's that undercurrent that's taking them in a direction they don't even realize they're going in. That's what life will do to you if you're not uh, persistent and insistent on moving forward. So you've got to take a step every day. 
Take a step every day in the direction that you want to be in, because what that creates is a habit. You've got to reverse engineer your life in some particular kind of ways and take a step in that direction. I have a 16 year old son. I got two more years with him and then I have to unleash him on society. I want to make sure that I'm making the best of my time with him. I want to make sure that I make it all count. I don't want to look back and say, dang, I missed some moments that I could have invested in him because I was out on the road, you know, uh, touring. You know, the, you, you, you all can get another Lecrae. He'll never get another father. Sometimes my wife and I will sit down and we'll say, hey, where do we want to be in five years? Because we're not just going to get there, right? We've got to start taking steps today, year one, to get there year five. And so we'll take some practical steps. We'll say, hey, where do we want to be in five years as far as our intimacy and in our, in our marriage and our relationship? Well, we want to be closer. We want to have a more dynamic friendship and relationship. So what do we need to do today to make that reality happen in five years? Well, guess what? We need to institute some dates. What, what kind of dates do? Not just us sitting at dinner because neither one of us may not have anything. To do. What do we enjoy doing together? Okay, we need to investigate what we enjoy doing together. We found out we love sports. We started going to sporting events together. It started creating some relationship and some intimacy and some endearment and some excitement. And now we have the shared interest that's exciting and fun for us. That moved to like, man, well, let's get season tickets because this is an investment in our marriage. It's not just about us going to this game. This is an investment in our marriage. And what that's created is a more kindred bond and a connectivity that in year one was being invested in by going to one game. By year five, we've been to five seasons and we have a more, a stronger friendship and a stronger bond than we would have had had we not taken those intentional steps. So whatever that is in your life that you want to see happen in five years, what are you doing today? What step are you taking today to make that a reality? That's what you're going to have to do. I love hanging out with my wife. She's the realist. I'm the romantic, right? So one of our first arguments uh, was in Paris because I was romantic and I was like, we got to go to Paris and I got the whole thing planned and I, we get out there, the weather's terrible, it's cold, it's rainy, but I got this idealistic romantic idea in my head and we get on a horse and carriage and go to the Eiffel Tower and I'm like, what do you think? And she's like, it's cold. It crushed me. We got into an argument over it. Why? Because I couldn't understand that she's a realist and I'm a romantic. And what's happened with us going to sporting events is like we get more time with each other to unpack and understand perspectives. So I'm the romantic. I'm imagining what can happen for this kid on this team if he wins the championship. She's the realist. She's looking at his stats. How did he do last year? Is this going to and we can bring that stuff together and start converse, a conversation. It's been great. Right. We, 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 we're, we cheer for the same team. We, we've done uh, uh, fantasy football together. We've invited other couples into it. It's become a real thing for us. But it's more than just sports. It's a point of connectivity for us. So when we show up to the game, we're both excited about something together. We're both walking together. There's always there's different seasons in the relationship. Right. There's seasons where you guys are face to face. Right. There's seasons when you guys are side by side, seasons you guys are back to back. Right. Face to face. Um, what I would say face to face is a lot of times is you're confronting each other. You're wrestling with each other's issues. You're having to deal with each other. It's like Ur, Ur. a lot of times you're back to back where you're fighting against everything going on around you. The bills, the house, the kids. And you, you got your back to each other just trying to take out enemies. But man, it's beautiful when you're side by side when your companions walking through something and just like taking it in together. And that's the season that we're in. And I want more of those seasons. So I gotta be intentional about creating more of those seasons. Some of you can't hear me because you're not healed, just straight up. You have 10 excuses already in your mind about why these cannot be your reality. And the reason why you think that is because there's some healing that needs to happen in your heart. There's some healing that needs to happen in your marriage. There's some healing that needs to happen in your own life. And until that happens, there's always gonna be a barrier for happiness, right? You can't get to happiness until you come to healing. So you're going to have to take some time and do some investigation on the areas of your life that need to be healed. 
I have family members and they sit around and they blame other family members for all the woes that they have going on. And you know why they do that? Because it's more convenient to blame other people for the trauma and the problems in your life than it is to look at yourself and be accountable for the areas where you've contributed, right? It's hard to own anything when you haven't been healed from all these other particular things that are going on around you. And the definition of trauma is not a bunch of things that happen to you. The definition of trauma is when things happen to you and you have nowhere to go. You have no outlet. You have no person to talk to. You have no one to process with. That's why I'm a big believer in therapy. I'm a big believer in community. I, you need relationships. If you do therapy, and I've done a lot of intense therapy because I've been through a lot of in hell, a good therapist is going to ask you, do you have a community that can support you? And if you don't have that, you're going to struggle because your therapist is only going to be there for an hour a week out of your life to help you unpack and pick at some things and uncover and move some rocks around. But you're going to need some friends and some community in your life that can support you as you navigate these things so that you can heal. And you're going to have to do the work to find these people if you don't have them, or you're going to have to do the work to open up and integrate yourself in the lives of some people that you know could be beneficial for you, but you don't want them around because you're still trying to do everything on your own, or you're, you're not ready to commit to being whole and healed. And so you're going to have to commit to that because that's the only way you're going to become the person that you really want to be. You'll always be chasing something which is all going to be a substitute savior for you, right? You're, you're going to find some substitute savior to, to, to make you feel whole, whether that's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whether that's a job or career, a paycheck, an acknowledgement, an award, because you don't understand that you were born with worth and value. So you've got to find wholeness and healing before you can find true happiness, for you can move in these directions. Otherwise, these are just going to be substitutes for the functional saviors for you. They're not going to bring you joy. Right. I've been there. I, I, I don't. There's no higher award I can achieve than the number one album in the country and the Grammy Award. Right. I've been at the top of the mountain. And trust me, those things do not bring you wholeness. You can chase them all you want. But they're not going to bring you wholeness until you deal with yourself and find healing. You're, you're constantly going to be coming back, bumping up against the brokenness that is occurring in your life and your family, so on and so forth. So for me, I've needed to make sure that I took the steps to be healed so that my family can be healed, so that I can operate and function in healing and we can move forward in that direction. Number one album in the country, beat Maroon 5, won a Grammy multiple Grammys, Billboard Awards, um, sold out tours. All the, the things that you would say define success in, in my space, in my industry, right? Um, but here's the thing, and I love this. My cousin Tim Ross said this, and it's, it's so true. When you watch the Olympics, there's a gold medalist, a silver medalist, and a bronze medalist. The most depressed person is the gold medalist when it's all said and done there you can go down the list and look at super bowl champions nba champions who find themselves depressed after winning that you know why because what else is there i did it what else is there this is what i was living for this is the moment i thought was going to make me something and there i woke up the next morning and, and it was just another morning i woke up the next day and it and nothing significant i did not feel any different. I was just the same person I was before with this award. The person with the most regret is a silver medalist. Why? Because he's thinking or she's thinking, dang it, I was so close. And that person's always chasing, thinking that fulfillment is on the other side of that finish line. If I could have just got the gold, then I would be satisfied. The, the content person is the bronze medalist. Why? Because that person knew from the jump they were not supposed to be there. They knew off the top that they were the, not even supposed to be in that race comparatively. Like, I know Usain Bolt's going to beat me, but I'm in the race with them. Mom, I made it. They're just glad to be there. Oh, my God. And I won a medal. This is amazing. 
And they find themselves content because they knew, man, this is all a blessing. Everything is a gift. I didn't even know I was going to be here. I'm just grateful that I made it this far. Right. I'm, I'm glad to know that the fruit of my labor has paid off in some kind of way because the metal was not an identifier for them. They were glad to be a part of it. And, and, and for me, you know, I, I did win my Grammy by happy. I didn't know that was going to, I wasn't like I worked for it my whole life and all of a sudden I got it. But when I did get it, guess what? The next one that came after that, oh, I worked for that. Why? Because I wanted that feeling again. Because in, deep down in the crevices of my soul, whether I wanted to admit it or not, it was giving me meaning. It was giving me purpose, identity that I already had from God, but I was exchanging the truth of God for a lie. I was Jesus being tempted by Satan and Satan was like, I'll give you the world. And I was like, I'll take it, sir. Thank you. And, and it left me broken. Why? Because you, you're empty again. And when it's over and then you want the next one. And guess what? After that, you're going to want the next one. And guess what? After that, you're going to want the next one. This happens in anything and everything. It happens with food, happens with sex, happens with relationships. You're not going to find satisfaction under the sun. You're only going to find grat you, You'll be gratified. You won't be satisfied. Nobody's ever eaten a meal and said, that was the best meal I've ever had. I'm done eating for life. It doesn't work that way. You're always going to want more. And so you can't find your hope in the meal, right? You have to see it for what it is. It's great. Thank you, God. Moving forward. Appreciate you when the next one comes along. And that's the perspective that you have to have. Otherwise, you'll be in a pit. I found myself driving an S-Class Mercedes, living in a million dollar home uh, with all these awards and plaques, more depressed than I've ever been in my life. I'm more broken than I've ever been in my life. And that dispelled the myth that money and success equals happiness. It definitely doesn't. The, the funny thing about the people say this all the time. I hate and love the statement that fame is a drug. I hate it because it's cliche. I love it because it's true. I hate when cliche things, when, when true things become so cliche, people don't pay attention to them anymore. Fame is a drug. It's a deadly drug. Fame got Satan kicked out of heaven. Right? Fame and pride are interchangeable. You want the glory and you're not built for it. We're not built for the glory. We can't contain it. We don't know what it does, the way it corrupts our soul. It's the ring in the Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> you saw what happened to Frodo? That's fame. And so for me, the, the drug of fame and being seen and being known, I'm known by this person. Y'all, I missed them calling my name to get my Grammy because I was on the red carpet and they told me that 2 Chains and Nas were coming over to interview me. I just wanted to be known by 2 Chains and Nas that I missed them calling me to receive the highest honor in music. Why? Because I was this broken, dysfunctional person who did not have the healing from trauma that I needed to have. So I just wanted to be known by other people who are just people, when I'm known by the creator of all people, but I just wanna be known by the people he created. It's craziness, it's madness. And so here I find myself chasing this consistently, wanting to be, it's high school, wanting to be on this level. I remember going to a Rock Nation party and I'm at this Rock Nation party and I see like the high school tables. You know, there's a cool kids table, there's a semi cool kids table, then there's everyone on the outside. And that's exactly what it was, there was like, the, the outside, and I, I remember it was myself at the time, you know, it was Childish Gambino and a couple of, this is before he was the Childish Gambino we all know, right? And, you know, a lot of Nipsey Hustle. We were all kind of out here lingering and, and, and meandering around. And then there was like this inner circle, right? This, this inside of, of that one where people could access the inner, inner circle. The outside circle, you know, Calvin Harris, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Will Smith's kids. I mean, they probably could have been in the inner, inner circle if they wanted to be. But but in that inner, inner circle, oh, Rihanna, Beyonce, Jay-Z, Nicki Minaj, Katy Perry. They were all in there and there was security around them. And everyone was just clamoring to kind of find their way in that inner, inner, inner circle. Why? Because in some kind of way, it would have made them feel more significant. In some kind of way, being connected to somebody that the world esteems so much makes them better. It makes you worth more. As if your worth is not intrinsic, as if you need it to be validated by somebody who is popular. It's high school. You want to be in a cool kids club. It's really stupid. 
And I found myself, I got to meet Jay-Z and that was cool. It was great, you know, it was, but, but it's one thing to meet somebody that you admire and in, influenced by. It's another thing to meet somebody that in some kind of way you feel like now you're more significant. Why do we want selfies with stars and we post them? Because in some kind of way we make it, it seems to the outside world that we're more important, right? Instagram selfies a lot of times are just people who need someone to hug them and say, you matter. That's generally what it is. And so I found myself trying to matter every day and finding myself chasing and chasing and more and more unfulfilled because the, the ladder just gets higher and higher, you know, and, and it, it became dark for me. You know, it became dark because now I'm literally the epitome of worldly because I want to be known and accepted by people. And the crazy part about it was I could mask it and I could defend it and I could justify it in so many different ways. On my best day, yeah, I was aware. But on my worst day, I was like, man, I don't even feel known by God. But huh, shoot, this celebrity knows me. The Rock is playing my music right now. I'm, I got to be somebody. And that's the sad part. Because that's so fleeting when God has given us the opportunity to have eternal value and worth and purpose. And we'll reject that for something that's fleeting. We'll reject the chalice of beauty and love for a cracked cistern, a toilet bowl of water that's going to leave eventually. I see us and I'm burdened for us when I see us out here and I see people on social media and and they have to put statements under their names to validate themselves and say, I'm really that girl, I'm really that dude. You don't have to to say those things unless you don't believe those things about you. And you're trying to convince yourself that you are. You're trying to justify your worth and your value. It's already been written in your DNA. You know why ancient Israel didn't allow statues? Because God did not want people making images of himself or others. Because God cannot be replicated and he doesn't need statues of himself because he's made billions of them called humans. We're made in his likeness and his image. You already are valuable, not because of your post and your clothes and the caption you put under yourself. You just need to be affirmed, right? What I, what I find is that a lot of uber successful people are people who are coming from dysfunctional and broken childhoods. And they're chasing and chasing because someone was not there when they were growing up to say, man, whether you get straight A's or you don't, I love you. You matter. How many times were you told, I'm proud of you, not for what you've done, but just because, man, I see you and I'm grateful for you and, and I'm proud of you for trying, right? We're, we're so wired to have to achieve these goals for family and friends to say, man, I'm grateful for you. And sometimes I just want to, I, I want to look at us and I want to see us as the kids that we once were. And I want to wrap my arm around them. And I want to say, Hey, I love you. You're valuable. And guess what? There's nothing you could do to make me love you any more or any less, because that's what God would say that you don't have to earn my love, that you don't have to earn my care that you don't have to earn your value. Your value is received, not achieved. And I see us constantly fighting for that. We're, we're excited about our views and our likes. We're not excited about the love that we've already experienced. If I'm loved by God, I don't need any extra likes to validate who I am. Right. But we're we're all broken and we're hurting and we're longing for those particular things that God has made so readily available for us. And so when I see that, you know, I'm, I, I want to encourage us and I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us to reject that superficial love, to reject 
that superficial, you know, comment that is giving you so much validity. And I want to encourage us to be reminded of what God says about you. That's who you really are. What did he say? Who did he say you were? Zephaniah 317 says that he rejoices over you. He sings over you. You know who told me that? I'll tell you who told me that. A janitor in a mental hospital when I was admitted there because I was losing my freaking mind. And I, and I was crying sitting in there and he walks over to me and he says, I saw you reading the Bible early. You should check out Jeff, Zephaniah 317. I thought this man was an angel. Why is a janitor ministering to my soul in my darkest moments? Yeah. And I needed to be reminded that God sees me. He rejoices over me, that he sings over me. I need to be reminded that Jesus is interceding for me, for me, not because I got the most likes and views on Instagram, but because he loves me, despite me, in spite of me, not because I did something amazing. Did that happen after the Grammys? No, that was before, but you know, I've still had plenty of terrible things <laughs> post Grammys. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, you know, um, post Grammys, post all of those particular things, I've still been in the darkest places that I never imagined I'd be. You know, I still I felt like I was returning to that place, you know, that place when I was 22 years old and I was driving down the highway and I thought I'm going to kill somebody or I'm going to kill myself. And it was only God that made me pull over, just walk into a hospital and just say, yo, I'm about to do one of these two things. I didn't know they were going to put me in handcuffs. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be thrown in the back of a police car, taken to the station and then ultimately admitted to a mental hospital. I got there as a Grammy Award winner, as a billboard chart topping artist, as somebody who's shaking hands with Beyonce and who's had the biggest celebrities in the world playing my music, um, I've gotten to those low places. And, you know, the reason why I can knock it is because I've had it. You know, people say, oh, don't knock it till you try it. I tried it. I tried it. I can knock it. Right. What do you want? Where do you want to go? Because I can go anywhere. Where do you want to go? I mean, I literally can go anywhere. And I, and I don't mind talking about it. You want to go hard drugs? I can go hard drugs. You want to go prostitutes? I got a prostitution story. You want to go uh, gun sh shootouts? I got shootout stories. You want to go molestation? I got that. You want to go abuse, physical abuse? I got that. You want to go abandonment? I got that. Where do you want to go? Right? I can go there unashamedly. And the reason why I can go there unashamedly is because I've experienced the healing from a lot of those traumas. And I can tell you, I tried to patch up all of that damage with winning things. It didn't work. I had to be healed. We all have to be healed. What does this chapter feel like now for you? Oh, this chapter of my life is freedom. You know, it's freedom because I'm not shackled and hindered by public opinion. Um, at least I don't want to be. So I'm taking steps to fight that actively. This season feels like freedom because, you know, I want to lead with love. I think a lot of people are leading with brash, unadulterated, like raw, you know, and and that's that's a way, but that's not the way. Right. Um, this season for me feels like peace. Peacemaking and contentment. Um, and practicing that. I've been through these cycles where, you know, people were like, oh, you're being political. Well, the whole world was being political and I fell into the trap. And you know what we tend to do? We tend to want to blame the brokenness of society on a political party. Because we don't want to admit that society is broken. We don't want to blame sin or say, no, no, never that. It's got to be somebody's fault. We have to create a narrative for why things are the way that they are. And so in this season of my life, I'm, I'm realizing, you know, I'm not, it's not, it's not a political party's fault that the world is broken. It's not. They can't own all of that. 
And that's not what's going to fix it. Voting for the right person is not going to fix the brokenness in our society. I'm content and I'm positive that Jesus is my hope. And that's not some pie in the sky like, oh, it'll be. a. But because he did resurrect and the tomb is empty, there is a future hope that I can flesh out on a regular basis so I can endure hard things and I can push for transformation because he said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here and it's now. And I can push for that to become a reality on earth as it is in heaven. So why try to fight to get people who are experiencing homelessness houses because of some like vain belief that in my lifetime there'll be no more homelessness? No, but because of some real belief that it's possible to push for those realities, that it's possible to put people in homes and see a a transformation happen. Why? Because Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, that I can function in that reality now, that changes can happen and it's not hopeless. And that ultimately the reality that I look forward to will happen because I'm taking steps today and pushing that agenda. One of my mentors told me, stop worrying about knowing everything. Share what you do know. Um, If you're gonna lead somebody, you just gotta be a half a step ahead of them, right? And that's why I'm hopping on the mic, is because I realize that I'm half a step, at least half a step ahead of a lot of people and I can share the wisdom and the experience that I have so people don't have to endure some of the things that I've endured or so people can get out of the pain and suffering that they're currently existing in. I wish I would have known there were folks who for centuries had dealt with so many of the things that I was dealing with and I could have accessed them and learned from them. Well, I'm trying to be that for other people. And so I'm behind this microphone to help people find healthy healing relationships to help people understand what success really looks like, to be able to to, to be successful without um, success owning them and washing over them and, and giving them identity. I'm also, you know, here to challenge us to be the best version of us that we can be because that's a reality, right? We're not stuck. This is not just how it is. We're not fixed in the state we're in. There is neuroplasticity, there is growth. The gospel is a seed, seeds grow, and bear fruit. There's fruit that can be had in your life from where you are right now that you don't even have an understanding of. I'm telling you, I'm also here because I wanna be transparent. I have been through a lot. You may see the success, but you don't see the suffering. And the suffering The success does not make sense without the suffering. Jeremiah 29, you know, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for a future and hope. A lot of people don't know that promise was connected to pain. It wasn't just this idle promise. It was people who were trapped in captivity, who needed assurance that they weren't going to be stuck here. Yes, you're in 70 years of exile, but I know the plans I have for you, plans for a future and a hope. That is how you're going to be able to endure the pain because you're looking forward to the promise. I just want to see you whole, man. I want to see people grow. I want to see people win. Um, You got an advocate over here. I'm a catalyzer. I want to catalyze people. I want to push people into being the best versions of themselves. I, I want to share my stories and my pain and my frustrations and show you how God is a restorer. Show you that I still have a limp, that even with the limp, you can still win the race. Right. This is not somebody selling you hope on like one day everything's going to be perfect and then you'll win. No, this is somebody telling you, guess what? You may have to limp all the way to the finish line, but you will finish. How do you do that? Well, I, I want to help you. And you know, you may be neurodivergent. You may got issues with your mind, with your body, with your physical health. You may have loss in your life. You may have lost children. You may be dealing with some wayward stuff. You may be suffering from some really terrible things that you've done in your past that you haven't got over. I, I want to encourage you. I love talking to the most broken, disenfranchised, castaway people and showing them that God has not forgotten them. So I don't care what you did. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what you feel like you're not going to be able to do. 
there is hope. God restores the years the locusts have eaten and your future is not fixed in a negative state.